Good morning. I know you put out a report early this week in terms of how Chinese assets are naturally hedged and, and, and have that sort of lower risk premium compared to other markets. On a day like today, though, where it doesn't seem like investors are distinguishing between what is what, what do you suggest people do these next, let's say very short term, these next few hours? Well, David, uh, obviously the situation remains highly fluid and the tensions have escalated quite significantly uh, over the past few days. Um, but from a strategy perspective, uh, we think, as you said, uh, China is relatively well positioned um, from a macro fundamental perspective as well as from a financial linkages sort of standpoint, um, as we detailed in the piece that we put out just a few uh, days ago. Now, of course, uh, in a situation like this, um, I think risky assets uh, will unlikely to uh, will, will, will have a tough time to perform. Um, so the strategy that we are recommending to our clients is that um, if they have to invest in the equity market, they should find something that has better risk reward. And I think from that perspective, we like Chinese A shares. And I think the simple story here is that China A right. is relatively insulated from these global macro factors, and we still see a lot of idiosyncratic, uh, attractive opportunities in the market. And within the Asia market, also you brought up in the report uh, a couple of days ago, Chinese defense stocks. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, um, I mean, it is. The, 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 the logic here, I mean, from a historical perspective, whenever geopolitical tensions uh, rise, then empirically, the uh, China defense and aerospace sector tends to outperform. I think that's the historical pattern. Um, and I think that that right. is not too difficult to explain. I think you, you see similar kind of market reactions, not only in China, but also elsewhere, like in the US and Europe as well. I mean, defense stocks uh, in these markets have also outperformed uh, quite significantly in the past few weeks. Um, so uh, I think that thematically makes a lot of sense. Uh, especially if investors' uh, concerns about um, geopolitical tensions remain. But uh, having said that, uh, I would also point out that uh, from a liquidity perspective, China uh, aerospace or defense stocks uh, is mainly concentrated in small mid-caps area, and liquidity might be a problem for some investors. On top of that, some of the names in the sector are already sanctioned by U.S. Uh, administration. So I think uh, from a practical perspective, uh, that might not be the most sensible option for investors. Uh, Kanger, hold on a second. We have more lines crossing here uh, when it comes to the situation, this, this uh, fire that's broken out at this p nuclear plant in Ukraine. President Biden uh, has spoken with the Ukrainian President Zelensky. That's the latest that we're hearing from the White House as well. Blinken also spoke with his Ukrainian counterpart as well uh, on what how they're going to respond to this. But, Kinger, I'm just interested to hear, just in terms of the exposure that China has to Russia, this increasingly closer relationship that Beijing has with Moscow, you add that to, of course, China's relationship with, with Europe. It, given just how much commodity prices have surged, would you say that this impact has, has greater um, moves or has greater impact on China than, than other EMs? Well, uh, so I would, I would say, Yvonne, the couple of uh, transmission mechanism here, right? So, I mean, you, you talk about the commodity prices channel. So clearly, investors are quite concerned about rising commodity prices, putting more pressures on uh, inflation for China, particularly uh, on the PPI front, given that China is a net exporter of a lot of commodities. Uh, but on that, I think it's, too, it's, it's still a little bit too early to really make a call on how the geopolitical tensions or the rising commodity prices might impact, uh, for example, PPI inflation in China on a more sustained basis. Uh, we are not changing our forecast as of now, uh, given the rising commodity prices um, uh, in the past few days. Uh, having said that, I think uh, to your other point, uh, which is the concerns about um, potential spillover of sanction risks from Russia to China, and I think um, this is 
that definitely came up in a lot of my conversations with investors, uh, considering that um, right now uh, China is Russia's largest trading partner, and the bilateral trade between the two nations has doubled over the past five years. Uh, we have very limited information to really quantify that risk, but I think certainly this is something that we need to pay attention to. Right. Kinder, even before anyway the war be began, I mean, this was already quite a tight commodity market. And uh, really, you, you saw it already in the outperformance of a lot of these upstream names, whether that's oil or elsewhere. H have you guys been revising your forecasts as far as earnings are concerned on that specific sector? And is it too late to chase that rally? Yeah, David, as you, as you may know, uh, we, we are quite positive on commodities markets um, in, in general, even before the, uh, the, the, the escalated tensions in, in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but because of the situation there, we have further revised up our commodity price forecast across the complex, particularly in oil, natural gas, and things like that. Um, and in terms of earnings impact, uh, certainly we are seeing upward earnings revisions for some of the commodities-related names like uh, oil names and, and upstream commodities names, uh, coal and things alike. Um, and I think one important point to really think about here is the spot market definitely is rising, but in terms of the um, prices that are embedded uh, or implied at the current levels, uh, evaluation levels for a lot of these Chinese commodities players, we think there's still a lot of room or valuation gaps that investors can explore. For example, uh, our analyst teams estimate that uh, right now, all, all the three oil majors in China, effectively the current prices are implying about only $60 per barrel for oil prices on Brent. So that's still uh, a lot of upside potential from here if geopolitical tensions uh, remain uh, elevated. Yeah, that's the external picture. Kinger, we have to talk about the domestic story, which, of course, MPC kicks off tomorrow. Um, is this going to be the much-needed catalyst that Chinese markets need at the moment? I think at the margin, uh, definitely investors are looking for policy signals and potential announcement coming out from the MPC, and in particular, the growth target for this year. Our view is that uh, the government will likely embrace a an, an, an about 5% growth target for this year, um, which we think is quite challenging given the domestic situation and also the global growth outlook at the moment. And that implies that we think uh, the government has to do a little bit more, a, a little bit more aggressive in terms of policy easing. So um, in the piece we put out just this morning, uh, we highlighted that um, infrastructure investment could be a key avenue for the Chinese governments to support growth um, and uh, for this year. So there's a number of air, uh, ways that we can play the China infrastructure story. And I think this is something that investors could look at uh, on a more tactical basis.